Good afternoon, Ozark First Assembly. We're so glad that you're tuning in with us. This is our Wednesday afternoon, sorry, Wednesday evening service uh, on May the 6th, 2020. And again, uh, we're so glad that you're tuning in with us. We are missing y'all. We are longing again for the time that, that we can come together. I've been talking with several of you at different places at different times, and, and I know that y'all are longing for it as well. So let's just keep praying. Let's just keep believing that it's going to happen soon. We don't know what quite what it's going to look like, but uh, we've kind of got some tentative plans made, but we've got to be uh, wait till uh, Governor Ivy and her team comes out with the, the, the new guidelines or the relaxed guidelines. And so when those things happen, you'll be the first to know. And because we want to come back together. That is our desire, that's uh, our purpose, and that's our plan. And so we're looking forward to that time. In the way of our prayer list to, today, let's continue to remember Sister Linda McCall, Judy Smith, Judy Munn, Kay Robertson, Patty Smith, Dr. Kenneth Brown, Tom Thomas. Remember Sister Sylvia as well. Brother Tom is supposed to have surgery. I believe it's tomorrow. And But Sister Sylvia, they've, they've also been in the process of moving. And so just be praying for them. Frances Fish, need to pray for her. She's in the hospital at Dell Medical. And uh, pray for our church family. Just pray for one another. And just lift up our entire church family. Anytime God brings somebody to, to mind, just pray. Stop right there and say a little prayer for them. Let's pray for one another, encourage one another. Let's continue to pray for those that have been affected by the, the storm of a couple of weeks ago. I know there's still a lot of cleanup going on, a lot of things happening there. Let's continue to pray for our health care workers and first responders and our national and state and local leaders. And let's pray that God will soon and very soon bring this thing to an end, that those numbers will go down and even with the, uh, the guidelines being relaxed, that they will not spike back up, that they will continue to come down, that we can get back to whatever the new normal is going to be, that we can adjust to that. And so we're excited about that. Again, we thank you for tuning in tonight. And so we are just looking forward to, to tremendous things. I believe, as we've said many times, I believe we're going to come out of this thing stronger on the other side if we'll keep our eyes upon the Lord. And we're going to talk about that tonight. But right now, let's have a word of prayer before we begin the message tonight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, and we praise you, and we worship you. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the one who was and is and is to come. And so, Lord, we humble ourselves before you. Lord, we are so thankful that you are in control. Your word says you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so, Lord, you handled our yesterdays. You can handle what we're going through right now, and you can handle what we're going to face tomorrow. And so, Lord, we are so thankful for that, and our trust and our faith is completely in you. And so tonight, Lord, as we look into your word, as we, Lord, this message that you've laid upon our heart, God, I pray that we will be encouraged. I pray that we will be re-energized. I pray if we have lost, anyone has lost their focus in any way, shape, or form, Lord, that we will get our focus back upon you. In the midst of even all these things that we're going through, God, you are still in control, and we give you the praise and the glory. Now, Lord, help me, your servant, to speak what you've given our hearts to, to, to share tonight. And I thank you again for... Pastor Matt and Pastor Scotty, though Scotty's not here with us right now, God, I thank you for their diligence and their commitment to help us get the, these things out like need to be needs to be getting out, gotten out. And so, Lord, we just give you the praise and the glory. Touch each and every one of our church family. Touch our prayer list, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. The other night, I was watching the news, and uh, I think it was last night. I was watching the news, and the news commentator, the national news commentator said, this is day 50 of the stay-at-home order since, that, since it's began, begun. How many of us ever thought that we'd be in this position in our world, in our nation, in our state, in our community, or even in our own lives? About the, things you th about the time you think that things are going to get under control, everything begins to get out of control again or becomes prolonged and, and as we said just a while ago, uh, 
we never thought, I don't know any of us who ever thought that we would still be walking through this time a month and a half later, over 50 days later. And it's not through yet. We still got a ways to go. But again, as we were praying a while ago, God is still in control. We can encounter things like this in our life as well. Not just during this time, but at other times as well. Most of us have and are being affected by what we're going through right now in one way or another. Some to a greater level or to a greater extent than others. But all of us have and are being affected. But with all this going on, are you facing a circumstance or a situation or have you faced a circumstance or a situation or a difficulty that you thought you had under control? You thought you had under control. You thought you had it, everything was headed in the right direction and suddenly everything shifts and you find yourself being overwhelmed or uh, headed in a direction you didn't want to go or being sucked under by the same thing that you th thought you had in control. All of a sudden, that thing you thought you had in control gets tremendously out of your control. Life can be full of changes like that. But the question is, when life throws those challenges our way, do we or are we fully and really trusting in the Lord to help us with those difficulties, to help us with those circumstances, to help us with those situations, what we are involved in or what we're going through in the first place? Are we really trusting in the Lord in the first place? And number two, the second question, and when things get out of hand, when things get out of our control, do we cry out for his help, his strength, his deliverance, and his direction at the first sign of danger or the first sign of trouble? Or do we wait till we try to handle it all on our own, then we cry out to the Lord? Those two questions we want to look at a little bit tonight. And in doing so, I want us to look at two individuals in the Bible, two very famous, I don't say Bible characters, I just call them individuals because they are true stories. One is in the Old Testament, Jonah, and the one is in the New Testament, uh, the Apostle Peter. Both of them are men of God. Again, Jonah was from the Old Testament, Peter's in the New Testament. And both of them are different in a lot of ways, but in many ways, in many things, their lives and their stories are the same. Both of them found themselves in a difficult place, in a difficult circumstance. But the same God brought both of them through. Let's look at the Apostle Peter first. Peter uh, is in a boat with other disciples. Now, what led up to this, Jesus had fed the 5,000. And then he told the disciples to get in the boat and go to the other side. He wasn't with them. He said, told, go, told them to get in the boat and go to the other side. He sent the multitudes away. And then he went up on the mountain to pray. And the Bible says somewhere about the fourth watch of the night, which is somewhere between 3 to 6 in the morning, he sees them rowing in the middle of the sea. Now, because the wind was contrary, there was a storm on the waters now. Now, how can you see in the dark? Well, Jesus, who created the heavens and the earth, he can see through anything like he can see things that we don't see. So he sees them. He knows what they're going through. And the Bible says he comes off the mountain through his, out of his time of prayer, and he begins to walk on the water toward them, walking through the storm, walking on top of the, the stormy seas. And he comes, acts like he's almost going to pass the disciples by, and they see him, and they think he's a ghost, and they cry out for fear. But he says, be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And then Peter begins to speak to him. And that's where we want to take up our account. In Matthew chapter 14, beginning at verse 28. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the waters. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Again, Peter's one of the first disciples that was called. He's one of Jesus' inner circles. He sees Jesus walking on the water, and Jesus speaks to, him, to all the disciples. And then Peter says, Lord, if it is you, 
He's not quite sure, but see, they've never seen anybody walking on the water, especially a stormy sea. Peter starts out well. He said, Lord, if it is you, bid me to come to you on the water. Man, he's, he's operating in faith. And Jesus says, come. Come on, Peter. You can do this. Peter gets down out of the boat, and he's walking on the water to go to Jesus. But somewhere from the time between he got out of the boat and before he reached Jesus, Peter loses his focus. He sees the winds and the seas raging around him. He becomes full of fear, and he begins to sink. He is in a very, very difficult, possibly life-threatening situation. What was Peter's problem? How did things change so fast? Number one, Peter lost his focus. He lost his focus. He got his eyes off Jesus. Number two, he's more concerned about where he's at and what he's going through and what he's involved in than keeping his eyes on Jesus. Number three, his whole attention is focused on the severity of the wind and the waves. He's more focused on his situation than on Jesus. And number four, he allows fear to take hold of him, which shatters his faith. One of the things that as many times as I've read this, and I've thought about it in, in times past, how quickly, how quickly Peter goes from faith to fear. How quickly he literally goes from faith to fear. He was full of faith when he got down on the boat. Didn't say he, he, he got down on the boat and began to sink. He got down on the boat, out of the boat and began walking to Jesus on the water. But when he loses his focus and gets his eyes off Jesus and gets his eyes on the difficulties and the storms and the waves and the sea raging, that's when he begins to sink. How quickly he went from faith to fear. He begins to sink. That word sink means to plunge down, to submerge, to drown. He's literally being overwhelmed and overcome and sucked under by the same situation he once had control over. The same sea he once, when he had faith, he once was walking on and overcoming. Now that same sea is pulling him down and about to drown him. He, once he had his focus on Christ, and he was doing something that no one else had done except Jesus. But when he got his eyes and his focus off Christ, now that same sea is pulling him down. If we want to apply it to, to our lives today, there's a lot of people that start out well. They have great intentions. They have their eyes on the Lord. They're in control. They're moving forward. They're trusting God. Lord, I'm following you. But somewhere along, the line, somewhere along the way, they get their eyes off the Lord. And they focus more on what they're involved in. And all of a sudden, a storm begins to show up or things, a difficulty begins to be prolonged, kind of like what we're going through right now. And we begin to focus more on what we are going through. We begin to get focused more on the inconveniences. We get, begin to get focused on more on the difficulties and the problems that all these things are causing, causing us at the time. And all of a sudden things begin to get worse. And we begin to become overwhelmed and, and overcome and, and literally drowned and sucked in by the circumstance and the situation that we once had control over when we had originally had our eyes on the Lord. I believe that's what's happening in a lot of places now. When we were going through this in the first couple of weeks, man, we got our focus on the Lord. We're going to make it through this thing, and we've tried to be encourage you. But guess what? Even 50 days in, we still have got to keep our focus on the Lord. But just how... Quickly things change. Peter went from faith to fear. Guess what? It changes again. All of a sudden, Peter gets his eyes back where they need to be. He gets his eyes and his faith back on Jesus and off the storm. Peter does something. He cries out, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. 
And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught Peter and lifted him up. Peter hadn't gone all the way down, but Peter lifted him up as he was going down, raised him up. And the Bible says they walked back into the walk back on the stormy seas. It says after they got into the boat, that's when the wind ceased. In other words, Peter got back upon those stormy waves, walking. He got to walking in faith again when he got hold of Jesus and Jesus got hold of him and he got his faith and his eyes back on Jesus. They walked back across that stormy sea and got back in the boat. And after they got back in the boat, then the wind ceased. Let's look at our other example. We're going to pull both these guys together here in just a minute. The prophet Jonah in the Old Testament. Now Jonah was a tremendous man of God, a tremendous prophet of God. And God gives him a huge task. He says, I want you to go to Nineveh, that great city. I want you to cry out against it because their wickedness has come up before me. Something we've got to understand. Before God, we don't have a whole lot of history about Jonah before this. But before God is going to give somebody an opportunity like that, before God is going to give Jonah a task like that to go preach against a, 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 a people, the Assyrians, that, that, that the, Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. Before God is going to give him a, 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 a project, a task like that, Jonah had to be faithful to a lot smaller task to proclaiming the word of God in, in other situations. And God gives him a, a task. He said, I want you to go prophesy. I want you to go cry out against Nineveh, that great city, because their wickedness has come up before me. Now, the Assyrians were the enemies of the Hebrew people. They had done a tremendous atrocities to the Hebrew people. And Jonah doesn't want to go. In fact, the Bible says when God spoke to him, Jonah turns the opposite direction, and he goes and gets on a ship to go to Tarshish, completely the opposite direction. I reckon he thinks he can try to get away from God. I reckon he thinks that if he goes over to Tar Tarshish, God's not going to be there. But he gets on that ship, and they take off for their destination. And God says, you're not going to run from me. And God sends a storm to catch up with Jonah. But Jonah's in the bottom of the ship, fast asleep. And the, 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 the sailors were so concerned about the storm, they're literally throwing out the tackle over the sides of the boat trying to keep, keep the ship afloat. And the captain goes down and finds Jonah asleep. He says, arise, O sleeper, cry out to your God. And so they begin to, the sailors begin wondering, why has this come upon us like this? They're, these trained sailors, these seasoned sailors are very concerned. And, but Jonah had told them, literally told them, that he was on the run from God. And so they begin to cast lots to see by who this, this great trouble comes upon them, and the lot fell on Jonah. And they, say, they begin to talk to him and says, what are we going to do? What are we supposed to do with you? And that's where we catch up on our story in Jonah chapter 1. Look there with me, verse 10. And the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what have you, why have you done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea, that the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Go to verse 15. So they picked up Jonah. They tried their best to, to, to get the ship back under control, but they couldn't because things were getting worse. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea and the sea ceased its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Jonah knew the Lord. Jonah had walked in obedience to the Lord most of his life, and, but when it came to this task, Jonah went on the run from the Lord. He doesn't want to do what the Lord has asked him to do. He's running from the task that God has given him. Jonah didn't start out well. Peter started out well. Jonah didn't start out so well. But how many of us know when you try to run from God, you're going to run right into God? Somebody needs to hear that tonight. When you try to run from God, you're going to run right into God. 
the sea come, becomes very rough, and John, Jonah knows it's because of him, and he tells the sailors, just throw me overboard and everything will be good for you. He is so set, dead set, about running from the task God is giving, giving him that he's literally, he's literally willing to lose his life in the process. Jonah is thrown overboard. He's, he's not about to sink. He's not about to go under. He's gone under. He's gone under the water. And the sea stops raging, but Jonah is sinking. But God is already a step ahead of Jonah. God in his love and his mercy and grace gives Jonah one last chance. God prepares a fish to swallow Jonah, and for three days and nights, Jonah is in the belly of that fish. You know, that is the amazing thing about the Lord. Because that fish just didn't show up by accident. It was not a coincidence. God knew what Jonah was going to do before he did it. And God had already prepared a fish, saw that fish grow up, made sure that he was going to be big enough to swallow Jonah, for Jonah to be able to stay in there for three days. And he had that fish as vast as that sea was. He had that fish at the right place at the right time and the right purpose at the right time when Jonah was sinking down. Before Jonah even began to take on a mouthful of water, that fish grew Swallowed him up. <laughs> Jonah has a chance to think about his decision. Can you imagine what Jonah must have felt like about the time that fish swallows him? Jonah's thinking he's, he's out of it. Jonah thinking he's going to die. And all of a sudden, the first minute he's in the belly of that fish, he said, well, I'm not going to be here long. Something's going to happen. And another minute goes by. Then an hour goes by. Then two hours goes by. About that time, Jonah, who's had a relationship with God, begins to realize, you know what? God's not going to let me out of this so easily. <laughs> He's in a place that he has time to think. Jonah's in a place he's never been before. He's very uncomfortable. It's dark. It's nasty. It smells. There's dead stuff. There's weeds and seaweed all over him. But yet he's alive for now. He has time to think. He has one more opportunity to make things right between him and the Lord. Yet he doesn't know what the outcome is going to be. Jonah, like Peter, quote unquote, is in over his head. How do we apply this? There are those who have known or know the Lord. And God has given you a task. God's given you an opportunity. God's given you a direction. And instead of doing it God's way, instead of taking advantage of the opportunity, instead of going the direction that God wants you to go, you say, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to go in my own direction. I'm going to try to do it in my own strength and ability. And they go in the opposite direction of what they're supposed to be doing for the Lord. They have done everything in their power not to go in the direction or to accomplish the task, or to take advantage of the opportunity that God has given them. But just as with Jonah, God is already one step ahead of you. And God, in His love, and His mercy, and His grace, is going to give you another opportunity to get things right with Him. He's long-suffering. He's merciful. He's gracious. God will allow a situation or circumstance that will cause you to, whether because of your own decisions or uh, your, your own actions, or whether it's just life circumstances or situations or difficulties, that will cause you to have time to think. It'll be difficult. It could be uncomfortable. It could be possibly harsh. It could be almost seem like there's no way out. But in that place, you will have time to think about your choices, your actions, and your decisions. Jonah has time to think. <laughs> he didn't know what the outcome was. He knew how it came in. <laughs> but can you imagine? I don't want to be gross here. But there's only two ways to come out of that fish. The way he came in or the other way. The way he came in is a lot better. But Jonah, after three days, he does something. 
he begins to cry out to the Lord. Look with me in chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly, and he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. I'm going to skip on over to verse 9. He says, but I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out on dry land. Jonah cries out to the Lord. Jonah repents and God delivers Jonah out of that situation. One of the most powerful verses in the Old Testament to me is in verse 3 where it says the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. The whole purpose for God, as mighty and powerful as that miracle was, that God gave him another opportunity so he could speak to him, so Jonah could walk in obedience. God delivers Jonah out of his situation. Let's see what both of these accounts, let's look at Peter and let's look at Jonah. Let's see what both of them have in common. Both are men of God. Both are dealing with a storm that they're going through. Both are in a boat and there's a lot of water around and the storm and the winds are raging and it's rough. Both have lost their focus. Peter lost his focus as he was going to Jesus because of the storm. Jonah lost his focus because he didn't want to do what God told him to do and a storm was the result. Both were had at one time had in control of their circumstance and situation they were in, but both became involved in a circumstance and situation that were beyond their control. Both men were drowning or sinking and going under their end, quote unquote, over their head. But here's the awesome thing. Even in their difficulties, even in their circumstance, even in their situations, as bad as it was, God was right there. He was close by. He was present. I want to just encourage you tonight. I just want to speak to someone tonight that even what you're going through, as difficult it is as it is, as rough as it may be, as dark as it may seem, as harsh as it may seem, God is right there by you. He's not left you and he's not forsaken you. Both men cried out to the Lord. And the Lord saved them both. Peter said, Lord, save me. He got his eyes back on the Lord. And even though Jonah is surrounded in the darkness, in the bottom of the ocean, in that fish's belly, he gets his eyes, his spiritual eyes back on the Lord. Jonah has a nine-verse prayer where he's repenting and calling back on the Lord. The Lord heard both men and saved both of them and delivered them both out of their problems. Even after their lack of faith on Peter's part and their failure on Jonah's part, both men went on to do great things for the Lord. Were both men completely perfect after this? No. Both of them made mistakes. But even with their imperfections, even with their failures, even with their missteps and mistakes along the way, they would get things right with the Lord. But God used both these men to do tremendous things. Both these guys have a tremendous amount in common. But the common denominator is the loving, merciful hand of God upon both of their lives. What does this mean for you and I tonight? What does this mean for you and I tonight? Even in our most desperate times, if we lose our focus and our faith becomes weak, even when we fail, God is watching over us and he is willing to help us and he's ready to help us when we cry out to him. God is close at hand. Like I said to begin with, we started out and this thing was lasted a day, then a week, then two weeks, and three. And boy, we were full of faith. Yeah, God is going to do some things. But now as this thing's become prolonged and things are still evolving things in a lot of ways things are getting better but now food supplies are becoming uh, become becoming threatened and different things are becoming cut off and and economic and paychecks are uh, getting cut off and things like that and different things are happening 
But friends, we've got to remember God is still our source. God is watching over us when we cry out to him. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Sometimes we can get over when we lose faith, or sometimes when we make mistakes or head the wrong direction, try to do things our way, we can get over our head. But we've got to understand that God is more, more concerned with us repenting and get back to the place where we need to be than for us to perish. I'm going to say that again. God is more concerned with us repenting and getting back to the place we, we need to be with Him than perishing. Psalms 46 verse 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. When Peter got in trouble and began to sink, God was there. And he, he, the awesome thing, even before Jonah was thrown overboard, that fish was waiting there. It says, all right, Lord, where is he at? The Lord says, here he comes. Kaboosh. Jonah falls in or he gets thrown in and he begins to sink. And that's so the Lord says, there he is. Fish comes up and swallows. Even before Jonah got thrown in, God was already waiting. Let me tell you, I'm not sure what you're going through, what you're facing, and how this has affected you. But God is right there. He's as close as the mention of his name. He's right there to help you. And he's willing and ready and able to help you and to bring you through. We've got to get our focus on him. There's no place, there's no problem, there's no circumstance, there's no situation that we can go to or through that God is not already there. Psalms 139 beginning at verse 7 says this. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I send it to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If we cry out to him, he will catch you where you are at and lift you up and out of that situation. Don't run from God. Don't lose your focus on God. But run to the Lord and keep your focus on the Lord. Keep in mind this, how quickly things can change. We may have gone from faith and got our eyes off the Lord and gone to fear. But how quickly we can go from that place of fear and anxiety and frustration Back to that place of faith if we get our eyes upon the Lord. <laughs> Jonah didn't know when he was coming out of that fish, but all of a sudden, one, minute, one second, he was in the bottom of that fish, in the belly of that fish, in the bottom of the ocean, and next thing you know, he is on the shore. He's done come out. I'd hate to look at, see what he looked like when he came out, but that end is a whole lot better looking than the other end, I assure you. But how quickly things can change. Cry out to the Lord and allow him to deliver you and set you free. Psalms 34, 6 says, This poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Then once he sets you free, then move forward and allow the Lord to do in and through your life that which he desires. Keep your life, keep your eyes focused on the Lord, being led by his spirit, giving God the glory. There is nothing that he can't and will not deliver you through. Where are you at tonight? Where are you at this evening? Are you in a difficult place? Are you going through a difficult time? Has this affected you adversely in ways you never thought possible? Have you lost your focus on Christ? Do you feel like all these things are overwhelming you? Do you feel like you're going under, that life is overwhelming? Are you looking at the storm and the circumstances and the waves and the situation? Let's get our eyes back on the Lord. Let's get our eyes on the Lord. Cry out to the Lord and set your eyes upon Him. Reach out for Him, for He is reaching out for you. 
allow his peace and allow his presence and allow the promises in his word and his power to keep you, to strengthen you, and to bless you. Tonight, if you're in that place, I want us to just bow our heads and, and we want to pray with you and for you tonight. The truth of the matter is, I don't care how long you've been serving the Lord, that there's times we always all can find, not that we always, but there's times we all find ourselves in those places. There's times we, at times we can all lose focus. But God is merciful. He's loving and gracious. He's more willing to get us, he's more, his desire is more to get us to the place back where we need to be. And even beyond that, than for us to struggle and perish. If you're going through that place tonight, we want to pray with you and for you. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you for the account of these two men in your word. Your word is spirit and it is life. These are not fairy tales. Lord, these are not uh, just stories someone made up. These are accounts of men in your word. And, Lord, these accounts are written down, as your word says in the New Testament, that we can learn from them, that we can grow from them, that we can learn who you are and realize that the same God, you're the same God that delivered Jonah. You're the same God, Lord Jesus, that delivered Peter, that reached down and picked him up. And, Lord, you're the same God that loves us and can deliver us and, and raise us up out of our difficulties and our, and our faults and our failures as well. Lord, for any person that has lost their focus, that's going through a difficult time, Lord, I pray tonight that they will turn their eyes back upon you. I pray that they will get their eyes off their circumstance and eyes off their situation and that they will focus solely upon you. I pray that they would cry out and if there's things in their life they need to repent of, God, that they will repent of those things and lay those things aside. And God, that they will seek your face. Because, Lord, your word says you're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So, Lord, we pray that as they cry out to you, God, that right where they're at in their home, if they're listening in their car, wherever they're at, God, that the power and the presence and the anointing of your Holy Spirit would minister to them, minister to them in their circumstance and situation, and move in a powerful and mighty way. Bring them out for your glory and your glory alone. Then, Lord, as they cry out to you and as they begin to follow you, let them see those purposes and plans that you still have in place for them. And, Lord, you're, that you're going to do tremendous and great things in and through their life, not only in their life, but to touch the lives of others as well. Lord, we give you thanks and we give you praise. Amen. If you prayed that, if if this is ministered to you, please let us know. And uh, just call the church office at 334-774-4941 or get in contact with myself or Pastor Matt or Pastor Scotty. We want to rejoice with you and we want to continue to pray with you. And as always, we want to continue to believe God together to bring us out of this storm that we're all in together. But let me tell you, God's faithful. We just got to keep our eyes upon the Lord. And everything's going to work out. He's going to bring us through. And now tonight as we close, as we've been doing over the last few weeks, we want to pray that priestly blessing. The Lord bless you and to keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. God loves you and we love you. We can help you in any way. Please give us a call. Thank you so much for tuning in. Share this with others. And we pray that you and your family have a blessed day. Amen. God bless. Good night.